going on, everybody? Welcome to a special edition of the House of Nerd Show. We are joined uh, today by Mr. Charles Ardai, writer of uh, Gun Honey, award-winning, award-winning writer, I should say. Uh, you got to put some respect on that name there. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Charles. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I, I cannot imagine a better place to spend an evening than the House of Nerd. I think any house I'm in is the House of Nerd, but this way we have three nerds, so we're doing better. Excellent. We got that's right. We got three nerds in the house. Oh, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. Not, not, not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Folks, we are here today to talk with you guys about uh, international bestseller, man, Gun Honey. Gun Honey flying off the shelves on the tip of everybody's tongue, man, is hot, is sexy, is thrilling. Uh, Charles, man, yeah. you 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 got you got a hit on your hands with this one here. Yeah, uh, listen, no 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 one could be more surprised than me. I mean, you try to tell a good story, but lots of writers tell a good story. You try to put out good art. Lots of people put out good art. Not every case that has good story and good art hits, and this one did. And I'm just so grateful because when I came up with the character. Joanna Tan seemed like a great character and you could do a lot with her and there could be many stories to tell. And we told one and we thought maybe that was the last one we'd ever get to tell because unless it's a hit, you don't get to tell number two. Mm -hmm. And we're so glad to be back with number two. So the first series of four issues, which is now available as a graphic novel is just called Gun Honey. That's it, no subtitle. Uh, but when we came back, she got a subtitle. So the second adventure, which is now um, in stores, the first issue came out last month, the second's coming out next week. Uh, is called Gun Honey, Blood for Blood. And uh, the, the third one, if we're lucky enough to do a third one, is going to be Gun Honey Collision Course. And oh. you can tell what the pattern is. So we'll have to come up with something that has Ds in it for uh, for number four. Mm. Okay. Besides Joanna. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you... <laughs> you are out point tonight. Yeah. Thanks so. a late night program. I guess anyone can stream at any time, but we're recording it late at night, so we can get away with stuff like that. Uh, yeah, look, you know, Gun, Gun Honey it was an attempt to create an adult comic book, not adult in the sense of you know pornographic, adult in the sense that it's for adult viewers. It's like when you go to the movies and you see a crime thriller movie like Ocean's Eleven, for example, or you know the Bourne pictures or the James Bond movies. These are not for kids. A lot of movies done today are basically for the four quadrants, right? You want a movie you can go to with your kids, with your grandparents. Everyone can go and have a good time. And those are great movies. Nothing wrong with them. You know, Pixar is great. But crime thrillers aren't supposed to be for everyone in the house. Crime thrillers are for the grown-ups. And so this has violence. And when people get shot, they die. And there's sex and there's nudity. And all the things that make adult movies so much fun. And that's where Gun Honey came from. Absolutely. Uh, right off the bat, I can say very much enjoying uh, Gun Honey from from issue one, from the first volume to now, uh, you know, issue, you mentioned Blood for Blood. Uh, issue one dropped uh, last month and issue number two of Blood for Blood is out uh, Wednesday, uh, excuse me, September the 28th, folks. Uh, so be sure to grab it. Uh, if you enjoyed issue one, you folks are going to absolutely be blown away by issue number two, man. Uh, somehow, Charles, you and the creative team managed to keep uh, upping the stakes, uh, surprising us, twist. Uh, and, and Joanna, you know, she finds herself uh, in these incredible situations. And, uh, and you know, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I don't want to spoil too right, much. No, no spoilers. But, you know, yeah. part of the fun of a character like Joanna, so Joanna is a weapons expert. The idea is she's not an assassin. We've seen that too many times. I just thought, do something different. And uh, Joanna's job is to get you the weapon you need, when you need it, where you need it, no questions asked. Now, in practice, she starts asking some questions, and that leads to story number one in the first four-issue series. But uh, basically, she's good at infiltrating places, getting in places that are hard to get into. Her reputation is she can get a gun into the Vatican, she can get a gun into the White House, Fort Knox, you name it. Um, and she's also good at getting out of places. So as I mentioned before we were recording, uh, in issue two, I decided, you know, she has this reputation for being able to escape from anywhere, but we never actually saw her do it in the first series or the first issue of the second series. So in issue number two, she's 
we we saw in the cliffhanger at the end of issue one, she's in a trap and she has to get out of that trap. But once she gets out of that trap, she has two more traps to get out of. And she does all that in the first, I think, seven pages of the issue. So yeah, the pace is the pace isn't slow. It, it's definitely not one of those slow books, you know, leisurely books, but that's OK. You know, it's it's um, I hope people have a lot of fun with it. Definitely not a slow burn by any means. A breakneck <laughs> pace, folks. Uh Buck, buckle in because you guys are in for a ride. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, the funny thing, so I, I've written uh, things other than comics. I've written novels, I've written TV scripts, I've written short stories, but I had never, I know I've been a comic reader all my life since I was a tiny kid. You know, my, my book was Flash, Barry Allen Flash. I read it since I was seven years old or eight years old. Uh, so I loved comics, but I never tried writing one. And they're very different than writing even a TV script, even though they're both scripts, they're very different in mm -hmm. part because it's a static medium. Each panel can only show one image, one frozen moment in time. So you can't say she walks down the hall, opens a box, pulls out a gun because, you know, a panel can only have one of those things in it. And so I had to learn how to do it. And you talk about the slow burn. The first comic I ever wrote was the first Gun Honey. And when oh. I look back on it, I thought, you know what? It's not slow, but I felt I really got the story started in issue two. Issue two was kind of a, issue one was sort of a warm up. It kind of tiptoed towards the edge, but the story really properly started in issue two. And I said, okay, this time, blood for blood, I'm not going to do that. The story starts in, on page one. You know, there's a dead body even before page one. You don't know it yet, but there's a dead body before page one. And so you don't give people a chance to catch their breath. That's that's like the Spielberg school of, uh, of, of, of pacing. It's mm -hmm. like Indiana Jones. The whole point is every scene is trying to top the scene that came before. So that, that's what I'm aiming for. Okay, and definitely, I feel like you've, you've accomplished that. Like I said, I feel like somehow you guys keep ele elevating and, and topping yourself uh, issue after issue. Um, and as yeah, readers, uh, would you agree? We don't we don't get a chance to uh, to catch our breath. No, I think even in the dialogue, you know, you you really you can tell that in the dialogue because sometimes there's not even like a name, right? You just get straight to the to the point in the dialogue, like you're walking in on something happening. Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. I've got a, a, a an 11 year old daughter turning 12 soon. And we've started reading Shakespeare, you know, of all the random things to bring up in the house of nerd, but we started reading Shakespeare together just because, you know, it's, it's a fun thing to do. And she's doing some stuff in school. Uh, and what I realized was, you know, is it surprising that Shakespeare is a genius? No, of course, it's not surprising. But what he does in scene after scene after scene, you start the scene, and somebody says something, and you're in the middle not the start, the middle mm -hmm. of a conversation. And the person who's talking, he says something, you don't even know what he's talking about, but with a few lines, you figure it out. And so you skip the boring parts. You know, Elmore Leonard, the crime writer, was famous for saying, I, you know, always skip the parts nobody reads, right? Don't write the parts that people skip. Uh, but it wasn't Elmore Leonard, it was 400 years earlier, Shakespeare figured out, you don't, you just don't write the part that people would be bored by, just start in the middle. People catch up. You know, people are smart. They figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you can go back to Homer, who started his story about the 10-year Trojan War in year nine and a half. That was pretty smart. Oh, Nobody yeah. wants to read nine years of Trojan War last year. That's enough. Deep, deep dive on some fantastic literature there. <laughs> right. Who knew? Who knew we'd talk about that stuff? Hey, but you know what? It's a, it's a good point that you bring up because it's filling, filling in the gaps, uh, as a reader, and I, get, I think as a writer, it, it's a fine kind of line to balance. And, and you guys managed to to kind of really find your groove and, and, like you said, kind of drop us right in and make it make it kind of not, not, not too difficult for the reader to, to kind of fill in those gaps and, and, and make the connections and keep that pacing moving, that flow. You yeah, know? for sure it's a fine line because, you know, you don't want people confused, right? If people get too confused, they just put the book down or they flip through the pages looking for the cool art and that's it. So yeah. you, the story has to make sense. You have to be able to follow it, but you don't want to bore people and you also don't want a lot of exposition. You don't want a page of, you know, 20 years ago, a group of soldiers did this and this. It, it's just, it can get sort of tedious, but where that line gets drawn, first of all, it varies by writer, but it also varies by reader. Like one reader needs a little more exposition than another, and you can only write one comic. So, you know, it, it won't be perfect for everyone, but we try to err on the side. I try to err on the side of being a little uh, less expositionary and just leave people to figure it out on their own. 
Yeah. And given that there's plenty of action to keep you interested and and plenty of eye candy of various sorts, I'm not worried that people will get too lost. You know, it's and the other thing is the storylines, you know, I, I plot them out carefully. But in the end, like a James Bond movie, I defy you to describe the plot of any James Bond movie. The premise, you can like Goldfinger, the guy's in love with gold. He wants to break into Fort Knox. OK, that's the premise. Yeah. But like beat by beat, what happens in that movie? I can't remember. <laughs> so this is true. Yeah. This is true. This is you true. You remember the set pieces, like you know, it, 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 the magic of a movie, a really great movie like Raiders of Lost Ark, is you actually could tell the plot of that movie from one end to the other, and it all kind of hangs together and makes sense. But that's mm -hmm. a rare script that works that well. Like Die Hard, uh, Raiders of Lost Ark, there are a handful of movies that good. So I don't say that Gun Honey's script is as tight as Die Hard or Raiders of the Lost Ark. We aim for that, but you know, no nobody hits that twice. It's like Spielberg didn't even get it twice. It's like Raiders was was like man. that, but Temple of Doom not quite so good. <laughs> oh I man, yeah. That. So uh, one of the great things uh, about one of the other great things I should say about this book is uh, the memorable memorable characters. Uh, so uh, the the title titular uh, character. Uh, Gun Honey, aka Joanna Tan. Yes. Um, yes, you mentioned her her speciality uh, sneaking in uh, weapons, guns into places where you don't think uh, anybody has any business getting in, into access to. And then also now we know uh, escape artist extraordinaire man. She makes she puts Houdini to shame. Yeah, there's a line in the book in, in issue two, which you've seen, but the rest of the people haven't seen yet, where she's uh, she's uh, captured and she's manacled like Houdini used to be. And when you see photos of Houdini getting uh, handcuffed and chained and thrown into a river, he was often naked and she's naked. And uh, but but she says before he would uh, get himself chained up, Houdini used to hide a lockpick in his hair. Mm. And how much hair did he even have? Not much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joanna has beautiful, long black hair. She can mm -hmm. hide more than a few things in, in there. So uh, that, that's one of her secrets. But, um, you yeah. know, it, it's I always was a fan of Houdini. I was a fan of magic. It's one of those things that nerds like. And so the opportunity to come up with a character who is not good, not only good at breaking in, but also breaking out of place is a lot of fun. Um, you know, I think of her a little bit as similar to a character like uh, Catwoman, but in reverse. It's like the photographic negative of Catwoman. She breaks in places, but instead of taking something out, she puts something in. That's So it's a completely yeah. different goal, but not a different set of talents. Absolutely. For sure. I didn't think about it like that, but that absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Reverse, reverse Catwoman. Oh. Reverse Catwoman. So one of the ideas I had, and nobody nobody in DC Comics is going to think this is a good idea, was we could do a crossover. We could do a, a, a team up where, where Catwoman and uh, Joanna meet. But the problem is, I don't think DC has the same level of tolerance that I do for adult material. So, you know, if uh, if Selena Kyle decided to uh, to uh, be as free with, uh, with her... Um, wardrobe as joanna right. is i suspect dc would uh their brain would explode <laughs> you know you never know though i mean there, there's know. been there's been a a confirmed a bat wang or two <laughs> That's true. I, I, I saw that on buzzfeed or somewhere yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, i forget what it was a black label or some one one of these not really the core continuity uh yeah yeah that's uh well, we may have to cross that that line one day too. We haven't done that yet in Gun Honey, but it, it may yet happen. I feel like we got to start a campaign. The the crossover we didn't know. There you that go. We That's we wanted, but we absolutely it, it could it happen. could work. I mean, I I guess um, Catwoman's the the better fit in terms of the character, but the 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 one who's truly wild is Harley Quinn. So that would be another you know another another part. You know, one interesting thing we just shot. Um, some model reference for an artist. So we work with painters of all sorts, the digital variety, the old school guys who, who use, you know, pigments on canvas and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the cover painters ask for reference photos. Some of them take their own uh, shots of models. Some of them want us to do it. And so we did a photo shoot with a model uh, for a painter who's doing a cover for us now. And I brought my little collection of uh, prop guns to, so that she could pose with them. Uh, but the the photo studio we rented turned out to be on the 23rd floor of a building that had a hardware store in the bottom. And I got there early and I thought, there's got to be some prop here that I can buy at a hardware store. And I, there's not much in a hardware store that you can use, but they had hammers. And so we had some photos of this model wielding two hammers uh, 
like like you know the guy in in old boy right the the movie where he goes down the hallway killing people with hammers and all i could think was how much she looked like harley quinn i don't know why i have no idea that harley quinn has ever used an actual hammer she's got that giant mallet you know the cartoon mm -hmm. mallet i don't think she's ever used a hammer but somehow this 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 beautiful woman with two hammers looked just like harley quinn so maybe uh maybe we'll have to use that for a harley quinn uh, homage cover or something <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, excited. So this is for an upcoming issue of, uh, of Gun Island? It is. This is going to be for issue four. So we did one thing that uh, was, was risque, even by our standards, for issue one. We worked with a French uh, illustrator, really brilliant French illustrator named Romain Hugo. Uh, I think he, he, I know for sure that he is, in addition to being an illustrator, a pilot. Uh, he <laughs> flies planes. And his specialty is beautiful women and incredibly accurately drawn fighter planes. Going back to like World War II, modern stuff, everything. And since in this storyline, we have a helicopter that plays a significant role in the plot, we thought, oh, this is perfect. He can draw Joanna and he can draw the helicopter. And he did a great cover for us. And Joanna's in a bikini standing in the shallow end of a swimming pool. And over her head, there's a helicopter. And we asked him, uh, how would you feel about doing two versions of this cover? One, she's in the bikini. And one, we take the bikini off because he's he does nude pinups. Mm -hmm. And we thought you can't put a, a a nude on the cover of a comic that's going to be sold in stores because it might offend people. But what if you put it in a bag? What if you sealed it in an opaque bag mm -hmm. and you told people this is a nude cover and so nobody's shocked by it. And then when they get home, they can open it. And I thought, well, you know, what the heck? We will try it. And it turned out to be really popular. So fans really liked that there was one version with mm -hmm. the bikini on and one version with the bikini off. So we tried that and people liked it. And so Pretty late in the game, we said, you know what? Let's do that for all four issues. And so mm -hmm. we found other artists to do um, nude bagged covers for issues two, three, and four. And the one I was describing to you was is issue four. I don't know if the painter, who's a, an Italian uh, painter in... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of which city in Italy. I can't remember. But uh, she's working on, on uh, that cover. And um, I don't know if she's going to choose the hammer photos or... A more conventional pose with a gun. I don't know yet. We'll see. I, I I haven't seen what she's doing. Excited to check that out. And you know what? I I don't know why I didn't think to. I I've got the nude bagged here somewhere. Oh, okay. I have you opened open it up. Uh, I've got to look for it. But what I do have uh, this beautiful um, Adam Hughes um, Virgin cover for issue number one of Blood, uh, Blood for Blood. Uh, just fantastic. You guys are uh, absolutely lucky to get Adam Hughes. I feel uh, beyond, beyond yeah. lucky. So he's one of my dream oh, artists. I love Adam Hughes. Yeah. I've loved his work for years and years. There are a handful of really great uh, cover artists working in the field where as soon as you see their art, you know who it is. It's like Alex mm -hmm. Roth. You know exactly who it is. You, you don't even need to see the whole piece of art. You can see one wrinkle in a piece of fabric in a costume, and you know it's Alex Roth because nobody pays, paints fabric like him. And... Uh, Adam Hughes is similar. If you see his a, a beautiful woman painted by Adam Hughes, you know it's Adam Hughes. And so I approached him. I didn't know him. He didn't owe me anything. Uh, we're not old friends. And mm -hmm. I reached out to him when we were doing Gun Honey 1, and nobody knew it would be a hit. Mm -hmm. And he took a chance on us. You know, he's very busy. He's in a, a enormous demand. But I think he, he liked the character or he liked something about what we were doing. And he said, okay, I'll do it for you. And um, that was the greatest kindness you can imagine. Then he came back to do one for, for Blood Blood, the second series, I would love to have a, an Adam Hughes cover on every every series we ever do of Gun Honey. Uh, he's he's just a genius. Now, who, who knows? There could be one where he just doesn't have the time, but mm -hmm. uh, we feel very lucky that I did it for the first two. No, I love the origin story you told in the back of the train uh, regarding the Gun Honey, how that came to fruition. Should I, and should I tell it here? Yeah, because I took it upon, and you know, it's so funny because you also write or written under an alias. Yes. And um, Richard, our, is it our alias? or It's alias. alias. It's Richard alias. And so I looked way too deep into it when I first saw it. And I said, <laughs> Richard, I'm like, oh, like, like Dick alias, like, like a uh -huh. private eye, like hard crime. And then, right. but then I, but then I was like, no, that's like an anagram, right? It's just an anagram. And then when right? I read it in the back of the book that it was an anagram, I was like, I took it upon myself, Sergio. I don't want to put your government name out there, but uh, I took oh, it upon myself to anagram. Oh, you, you do it, okay? Go ahead, Sergio's name, and yours would be Zigzag Loosener. 
That's great. Zigzag <laughs> loosener. I have way too many letters in my name to to do it, but for Sergio, zigzag loosener would be zigzag. Your... <laughs> okay. I love that. We should make a villain in the book called Zigzag Loosener, or maybe not a villain. Maybe this is like an expert at something who helps her out. Zigzag loosener. How do you spell loosener? L O O S E N E R. Like the word. Yeah. Oh, that is too good. Yeah. It was exact. I said, what are the odds? <laughs> I, I love it. I really love it. Well, I, I would be honored and privileged to try to come up with an anagram of your name, however hard it is. So you can email me privately and, and yeah. let me know what letters I'm using. Uh, but yeah, so Gun Honey came about in part, the, the name Gun Honey came about because I have a friend named Yuni Hong who spells her name E-U-N-Y-H-O-N-G. She's a journalist, a respected journalist for many financial newspapers and websites. She's written two uh, nonfiction books and a novel. And she said, uh, we were having lunch and she said she might want to write a hard case crime novel at some point, but mm -hmm. wasn't sure she wanted to put it out under her real name. You know, it's a lurid pulp fiction. She might want to use a pseudonym. And I said, that's fine. I used a pseudonym. I did my first two books under a pen name, Richard Alias, which as you said, is an anagram of Charles Ardai, meaning all the letters in a different order. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's fine. If your name is Charles Ardai, you've got good letters. You've got H, R, S, you know, those are good letters and you've mm -hmm. got plenty of them. Try doing that with Uni Hong. You can't come up with a good anagram from Uni Hong. And I thought for a minute or two, and I said, well, what about Gun Honey? And that's where Gun Honey came from. Gun wow. Honey is an anagram of Uni Hong. Now, Gun Honey would be a terrible pseudonym. You can't say, you know, The Grapes of Wrath by Gun Honey. It, it's, it doesn't work as an author name. But, um, a little specific genre, maybe. But... Maybe for a specific genre, right? Not The Grapes of Wrath. But, you know, but as a title, as a book title, it seemed great. And I offered it to her and she, she, you know, she, she thought about it for a while and she never ended up writing the book. And then I started thinking about it. Like, what would a book called Gun Honey be about? Well, it obviously has to do with guns. And, uh, you know, if you're calling someone Honey, it's kind of a, an old style sexist throwback nickname. So maybe that's a nickname people give to this woman who deals with guns. Well, what does she do with guns? And that's where it all came from. So the title came first. And uh, now we're, we're always... Uh, thinking, you know, what if we do another comic at some point with a different character, how do we come up with a title that's as catchy as that? You yeah. know, you, you go down the same path, Blade Lady. It doesn't work exactly. So we'll we'll, we'll have to think of other cool uh, cool titles. But I, I do like anagrams. It's another example of nerdiness, you know? People mm -hmm. who rearrange the letters in names, it's like Tom Marvolo Riddle. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember? <laughs> yeah, Hopefully good. after all these years, that's not a spoiler anymore. Um. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so anagrams are fun. That, that's the, the bottom line is Shakespeare, Homer, and anagrams. Now we're really pushing the edges. Wow. So there you have it, folks. Uh, that's how Gun Honey came to be. So you got the title for the book first, excuse yep. me, book first before you had a story. Uh, yes, that, that, that's right. That happened before. So uh, when I founded the line called Hard Case Crime, which started just doing traditional novels, you know, the kind that's all words on paper with one piece of art on the front cover, that's it. So classic traditional novels. I founded that line uh, about almost 20 years ago now, and we've published more than 100 books. Uh, I founded it with a friend of mine named Max Phillips, and we were both fans of these old style pulp paperback novels with this sexy cover art and high velocity stories. And uh, we said, why doesn't anyone publish books like that anymore? And then we drank some more over that long evening. And, and, and finally, I said to him, why don't we do it? Why don't we start our own line of books? Now, there are many reasons not to. I mean, it's a terrible idea. You could go broke trying to start a line of books. But we did it. And um, he had the idea that we would each write a book for the line. You know, he's a novelist. I'm a novelist. So we said, OK, we're going to do that. Uh, and he came up with a fake title for a fake book. His title was Fade to Blonde, like the old movie maker's uh, line, Fade to Black. Like you've got the pictures on the screen and then you fade to black at the end. Gotcha. But in his case, it was Fade to Blonde. But he just made up that title so that he could dummy up a fake cover that we could use when pitching Hard Case Crime to publishers. Mm -hmm. We were pitching it around town and we needed to show them something. So fake cover, uh, Fade to Blonde by Forrest DeVoe Jr., fake author name. Gotcha. And then he started thinking... I wonder what a book called Fade to Blonde would be about. Well, clearly it has to be set in Hollywood and there's got to be a woman who's blonde. And he started building that up and he eventually wrote the book Fade to Blonde by Forrest DeVoe Jr. And he was going to publish it under the fake name Forrest DeVoe Jr. But at the time, he also had a line of spy novels coming out from a different publisher and they wanted to use the fake name Forrest DeVoe Jr. on those. So okay. he ended up publishing ours under his real name. But it, it's called Fade to Blonde. So yeah, we, we've gone from title to book. We've also gone from art to book where we had a painting that we wanted to use and we showed it to an author and we said, work this into your book. And that's how the book came about. 
that's great so fade fade to blonde is that the first uh hard uh case hard crime case. novel then it is the first original so hard case crime does two different things one we reprint old books that have been out of print for 10 20 50 100 years we oh, find wow. really good books and we reprint them so we did that okay. and then we also publish original novels brand new written just for us so fade to blonde was the first new novel the first original novel and and it won the Seamus award for best paperback pi novel private eye novel of the year um the first reprint was a book called grifter's game by lawrence block now lawrence block is a terrific writer he's still alive uh still working um and he's got a new book out in fact in a few weeks called the burglar who uh met frederick brown uh, but grifter's game was a book he wrote back in 1961 if i remember correctly and it had been out of print for many years and we brought it back and uh, so that was our first reprint. But in 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 the remit in the next eighteen years, we've published books by Stephen King, Michael Crichton, Ray Bradbury, the filmmaker uh, Brian De Palma, uh, Sam Fuller, who was another really? very good filmmaker. Wow. All sorts of cool people, and and first time writers, you know, people who had never written a book before. So I, we're we're very proud of those books. Absolutely, super super duper impressive, man. I think I yeah, I think I first heard about you guys when. Uh, the Colorado Kid came out. That was Stephen King's Because I'm a big, and I love the story because I did hear that story too about you asked for a blurb and he's like, I can, I can one up that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So well, I, I reached out to Stephen King, who I also didn't know. Like I reached out to Adam Hughes and I didn't even think I'd hear back. You know, Stephen King, he gets contacted so many times by so many people. And uh, after a few months, I did hear back. And, and that was the message from his agent. Hey, Steve doesn't want to write you a blurb. We just reached out to him to see if he would say something nice about our books that we could quote on the front cover or back cover. And uh, he said, no, no, Steve doesn't want to write you a blurb. He wants to write you a book instead. And that's where the Colorado, came, Colorado Kid came from, uh, which wow. then became the TV series Haven, which is how I got to work on TV. And, you know, it, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, Stephen King didn't owe us anything. And, and he was just an abnormally generous person who decided he would publish his new book with us instead of his usual house. And that's honestly, that's why we're still around. Gun Honey wouldn't exist. Hard Case Crime Comics wouldn't exist. Hard Case Crime Books wouldn't exist if it weren't for Stephen King being kind enough to let us publish his book. You know, that's what's kept us in business all this all these years. And um, one of my favorite, uh, yeah, one yeah. of my, uh, I didn't birthday. realize today. Today's Stephen King's birthday. Happy birthday, Steve. Oh, oh th this is his gift from us. Happy birthday, <laughs> Stephen, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, um, no, just, um, you know, when I was looking at the all the, the roster of people you guys have published, and it, it is incredible. There's so many cool people, and, like, even, more, like you said, more recent, like, Krista Faust and Daniel Krause. I love yes. both of their books. And then I saw on it that you guys actually published some of uh, Robert B. Parker's books, and I went through this, like, <laughs> hardcore phase oh, for whatever reason. I went through okay. a phase when I was, like, like 10 years ago i was like 21 22 i read every single spencer book wow and paper doll is my favorite but i was like for some reason so when i saw that on there i'm like i'm about to get in trouble because i'm gonna have to <laughs> well let, let me let me uh let me save you um from 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 an error that is kind of our fault well. and i will i will tell you the true story behind our robert b parker book so we published a book called um Passport to Peril, set during World War II or just after World War II with spies in Europe. And it's very exciting. It's a good book. And you, you might enjoy it if, if you read it. Mm -hmm. It's written by Robert B. Parker, but it's not the same Robert B. Parker. <laughs> it's a different guy. His really? name just happens to be Robert, Robert B. Parker. <laughs> and the thing is, he came first. The okay. famous Robert B. Parker came second. Okay. And so there was this guy around World War One, World War II, who was a, a journalist, and he was a very good writer. He published three novels, and his name was Robert B. Parker. And then many years later, this other guy showed up. And when um, I think one of them had the name Bogardus, I think that was his middle name. I forget what the other one, Brown. Yeah. In any event, so um, somebody sent our book to the famous Robert B. Parker, who was still alive at the time, and he said, you know, you you should you should get these guys in trouble. They're clearly trading on your name. And he said, he, he was very sweet about it. He said, well... This Robert B. Parker came first. I knew he existed. It's mm -hmm. not his fault, right? I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like I can keep his books out of print. That's not fair to him. Uh, plus, these guys do say on the back by the original Robert B. Parker, not the same guy. So, and, but that's so funny. I, I'll be honest with you. The the fact that his name was Robert B. Parker did have a little bit to do with why we got interest in publishing it. So, you know. and do you want to know why? What's even funnier than that to add to it is. 
the Robert B. Parker, they're still releasing books with his name on it, yes, but written by other authors. Other yes. And so when I saw the original, I said, oh, they must mean like, but, they must know, mean the real Robert guy. Right? <laughs> so I, it is a good book. Wow. It's fun to read. I'm, I'm, I'm all for you reading it, but don't read it thinking it's the other guy because it's not. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, if I can ever find a uh, person named JK Rowling, I'm going to publish a book by that person too. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah Carl Rowland. Yeah. <laughs> get, get, maybe get the real JK. JK. Yeah, you know, that's a funny thing. So I, I wrote to JK Rowling at one point and I figured, you know, I'm on a roll here. I, mm -hmm. I, I wrote to Stephen King and that worked out. So I wrote to JK Rowling and I sent her some books and I didn't think it would even get to her. And then months later, I got a note in the mail, very, and she said, no, I mean, I said, uh, would you consider writing a book for us? And she said, no, but mm -hmm. this was when she was still writing uh, Harry Potter. And I got okay. this very little uh, handwritten note in the mail from JK Rowling, signed Joe, um, saying how much she enjoyed Hard Case Crime and thank you so much for sending the books. And each night as, uh, you know, when I'm done writing ha Harry Potter, I think she was working on book five or something at the time. Each mm -hmm. night when I uh, finished writing that day's piece of Harry Potter. I take one of your books into the bath with me to, to uh, uh, decompress. And mm -hmm. that was just a really generous, kind, sweet note for her to send. She didn't have to respond, you know, especially if the answer was going to be no, she really didn't have to respond. And she did. So I've always had a soft spot in my heart for her. I know not everyone loves her anymore, but she's, she's really, uh, at least to me, she's, she was a very nice person. Hey, that's the highest compliment. I think if someone takes your work, into the, into the washroom, into your personal <laughs> me time. As we, we get viewers, they say, hey, we watch the House of Nerd show. You know, when we're doing our, our private business time in, in the washroom, mm -hmm. I said, I said, my friend, that is the highest compliment. I agree really with you. Have. That's that yeah. means, you know, that's intimacy, right? And I so, Joe, you. now that you mention it, I'm pretty sure you left your, your uh, poly bag cover in your bathroom. <laughs> Now, now that I think about it, I, I, I won't ask why. <laughs> oh, that's man. probably where you left it. Uh, well, that, they're worse places. It's poly bag, so you know if the shower goes <laughs> off, it won't, it won't get ruined. You can always buy another one, right? You know what? I just, I just see. I've got it here. Oh, now look at that. So, right, so you see that in the store, you're, nobody's going to be offended. Nobody's going to be hurt. Yeah. If a five-year-old kid sees it, they're not going to be there scarred you for life. You know, if dad buys it and takes it home and opens it up. You know, that's that's dad. That's or mom. You know, I I hope that we have uh, female readers as well as male readers. You know, once in a while, people have said this is very male gazy. You know, it's it, mm -hmm. because Joanna doesn't wear all her clothes all the time. That's very male gazy, and I know what they mean by that. And I I'm not knocking them for saying it, but mm -hmm. in some ways, I feel that does a disservice to the female readers who enjoy a beautiful half dressed uh, character and uh, or 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 being half dressed in their own private lives. You know, it's it's not as though every woman who ever gets undressed does it because some man is watching, you know, it's, mm -hmm. there are plenty of women who get undressed and enjoy it because it's a source of their own pleasure. So I, I can't I, wait I for my kids that. to get out of the house. Uh, yes, my youngest exactly. is four. When, when you got privacy. Because please, the way Joanna lives, I'm just like, she has the Bacardi. She <laughs> has the massager. <laughs> she's right, right. She's got on the, the island. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the thing. It's like, if, if, if you were decompressing, you just went through a life-threatening adventure in the first series, you're decompressing, you're on an island, you're by yourself, no one's bothering you, it's it's like tropical weather, you've got a pool, why would you wear a swimsuit? Explain that to me. Mm -hmm. I would. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and and, and to, your, to your point, guys, uh, I got to say, really, truly, uh, Charles, you and the creative team really, because, again, it's another, it's another fine line between between sexy, adult, uh, fun, and sleazy. Yep. And and, <laughs> and you know what? I, I feel you balance that line perfectly. Yeah, I, you know, I really appreciate that. You know, we're trying. Sleazy. We want to be fun, fun, is, fun yeah. and sexy. We're not trying to be sleazy. Um, mm -hmm. Our villains might be occasionally, you know, over the line because they're villains. They they have to do bad things. But right. uh, you know, Joanna's a good guy. Joanna, you know, she she's an anti-hero. She's an anti-heroine, if that's a word. Oh, uh, she she does some things that are questionable, but she's definitely not sleazy. She's she's got a code. The she's only time I was ever worried about um, her lack of wardrobe was at the spa because I didn't want her to slip. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> I said, don't fall, don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing, Joanna. She was, she was running, and yeah. uh, 
Yeah, that that's uh, I'm not sure exactly where Joanna lives. It's an interesting question. She's in California somewhere near the Golden Gate Bridge, so it's probably San Francisco. Uh, but there's there's a vibrant Korean spa culture in California. Mm -hmm. And so I this is an imaginary spa just made up. But I, I know there are plenty of uh, spas like that out there. And I just thought it would be a fun place to uh, a fun place to go. Oh, yeah. no, because I love the I, I like the flashbacks, too, that were, you know, where we learned some more about her in those scenes, too. So I thought that was and, and for me, like, as far as the nudity goes, I don't ever feel like it's gratuitous. I feel like it's all well placed. Um, yeah. I will say I was <laughs> there was that one scene where I was like, wait a minute, because I just oh, wasn't mean, I wasn't expecting the, uh, the, the um the, the double page scene. spread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, expecting... it's just one page. Oh, okay, wait. I didn't expect that reveal. So when I turned the page, that's it. That's I it. said, uh uh. <laughs> it, it I'm is in the a, living room. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's a bit graphic. It's but you know, it, it there was a reason for it. There was uh which I thought was of... also very funny, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, the role her race plays in yeah. the story. And so I thought that was very tongue in cheek, just having her cut her hair. Like, yeah, we're the same. Person. Yeah, 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 Ex exactly. You can't tell us apart. You know, it's, um, yeah, race is another issue that, that I, uh, I'm glad we're getting to explore because there are so many characters out there. I mean, now it's different. There, there are more characters with mixed race and minority characters, and that's great. Uh, but I'd say the vast majority of, of characters out there, main characters, are still white. And I thought it would be interesting if this character had a mixed race background. And, you know, in honor of uh, Yuni Hong, who gave me the idea in the first place, thanks to her name being rearranged, uh, I wanted the character to be either partially or entirely Asian. She ended up being half Asian. Her father's from Corsica and her mother's uh, Malaysian. And she grew up in Singapore. And I just thought it gave an interesting dimension. You know, she was uh, from another country. She had to flee when her family got murdered and she made a new life for herself. It's a classic immigrant story. Sadly, her, her maybe not sadly, but her the new life she made for herself isn't technically legal. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, but that's not that uncommon either. So it's 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 a success story. She she came to America and made a new life for herself. And I just thought that's that's a fun thing to explore. And her parents' story, I would be interesting, interested in hearing too, because him coming from there to Malaysia and then being who he was in Malaysia, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So I did something that was uh, I thought was funny. And the the people who, who uh, I work with from uh, Singapore and Malaysia. So Angkor Kang, who draws the interiors, who's a brilliant, brilliant artist, uh, lives in Malaysia. He's, he's in Ipoh, Malaysia. And uh, the couple that owns Titan Comics... Uh, one half of that couple is uh, from Singapore originally. So, and and now we're working with a Singapore-based, um, uh, Singapore slash Malaysia-based uh, TV production company to try to turn Gun Honey into a TV show. We'll see if that works. But so I, I'm in contact constantly with people from Singapore and Malaysia, and they uh, rolled their eyes when they got to the part of the first series where I had this crime family living in Singapore. And they said, that's ridiculous. Singapore is legendarily the cleanest, uh, least criminal place on mm -hmm. earth. And right. you can just go across a bridge and you're in Malaysia. If you're a crime family, you would do it in Malaysia. You wouldn't do it in Singapore. Uh, okay. And I, I was, I was, yeah, I thought it was funny to imagine a crime family in Singapore. It was not so much funny. It was just wrong, you know? So my, my apologies for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's like imagining that you've got, you know, a street crime on Park Avenue in Manhattan. It just doesn't happen. But, do. uh, anyway, that, that is, that is my, uh, my, my, my lack of, uh, of knowledge, but you know, one of the things that I hope happens if Gun Honey does become a TV show, and you know, it's probably odds off just because so many things try and such a small percentage actually get on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're working with the same uh, set of producers we worked with to create a Haven, based, which was based on the Colorado Kid. And oh. that ran for six years on sci-fi. So maybe it'll happen. Uh, but the idea would be to actually film in Malaysia, film in Singapore, work with local crew and local cast. Uh, so that it would give an authentic picture of someone from that part of the world. And I love that idea. You know, I, I love the idea of getting writers from there uh, so they can they can take out of the book whatever is good and then inject into it all sorts of stuff that I might never even think of because I don't live there. Absolutely. And, and that's what, uh, you know, I love the art. Uh, um, Anghor Kang uh, and Asifur... I'm sorry if I'm butchering the uh, Asifur Ramen. Asifur Ramen on colors. Yes, thank you. Uh, man, those shots when because uh, this this is an international book. You got you got your you know uh, location set in Malaysia, in Milan. Uh, now in the second volume, South Dakota. Um, right. 
but uh, particularly with the what with the southeast asian locations uh you know with the artists being from asia i feel like it really lends a uh an authenticity uh, as a reader you know uh, i'm transported you know the streetscapes uh it looks busy you hear the sounds uh so i think i think that's wonderful and i think uh for those folks who have not yet picked up Kanye, please do uh because it's one of those books on top of just being uh straight up entertaining uh you know it kind of you're absorbed into this into this world uh just sucks you right in and, and in large part or at least in part uh to the art just fantastic uh creative team there that you guys have uh, got on this book here um, thank you yeah ang is absolutely brilliant osfer has done a beautiful job on the colors mm -hmm. i feel very lucky uh, to be working with both of them on it, and they're working very hard on it, so I'm very grateful. Asifer is uh, working uh, digitally, at least I think he works entirely digitally, but Ong is um, is old school, and every time he sends me photos of work in progress, I see an actual drafting table with a ruler and pens, okay. and uh, you know that's not easy. You know I admire that, I respect that, and I admire it, and I think that's part of what gives it its old school look. Mm -hmm. uh, man coming up with 22 pages a month of that hand-drawn art is not easy and we got we got some interior slides here uh this fantastic art yeah i gotta gotta showcase this man uh there you got uh main character joanna tang uh tan excuse me uh gun honey yes now hang on before you change uh one of the things that uh, ang does that i absolutely love is a kind of will eisner thing where he plays with the physicality of his frames his panel frames if you look on the right hand page here you see that one of the mm -hmm. uh thugs who's helping joanna up onto a boat is mm -hmm. leaning on the next panel down to brace himself as he as he pulls her up onto the boat i that's love great. stuff like that oh, and that's sure. not in the script you, you can't write that stuff that's an artist's imagination i just i that kind of thing just knocks me out every time Ang does it you get you get back those traditional pencils uh yeah just kind of blowing away eh? you see those little touches that he's adding to the to the book yeah absolutely you know I, I I just love it and I come up with things that I'm nervous he might not know how to draw you know I, I there's a in, in issue two which you've read there's this giant RV a recreational vehicle that is so big you can drive a car up inside it and I thought how's he going to draw that <laughs> that's not that easy. That was really cool. That was really cool. Yeah. Uh, so for folks, yes, who are, who are watching this, uh, we got a chance to check out uh, issue number two. Again, reminder out uh, Wednesday, September the 28th, folks, you guys are going to be blown away. And I think actually, let me let me pull those. Out. I think we got a couple screeners from. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. Issue number two. Right. I'm trying to think which pages can be shown on YouTube. Oh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, the left-hand cover here is Derek Chu, who's a very uh -huh. popular artist. And uh -huh. the character, since you can see she has blonde hair rather than black hair, is not Joanna. It's actually the villain in the book uh, uh -huh. who you're going to meet. Uh -huh. And uh, on the right side is a uh, a Romanian painter named Molochea Amelian, who's very good. I may be mispronouncing his name, and I apologize. He is also uh, working on some of our uh, nude covers for uh -huh. issues uh, two, three, and four. So, uh, you'll get to see more of his work as well. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Uh, I love that every issue you guys have a, a great, uh, variety and, and range and style, uh, for the art on, on these, uh, on these covers here. Uh, <laughs> there's the black bar covering her, uh, her capacious cleavage. Yes. Um, I guess butts are okay. I, I don't know, but, um, yeah, the, the funny thing is you, you don't actually see very much. If you took that black bar away, you wouldn't see very much, but there's the slightest, teeniest, tiniest hint of rose peeking out above, mm. the, uh, <laughs> above the towel. And that little hint of, of pink is, uh, you know, is forbidden. I guess people are just nervous, but they don't mind yeah. showing guns. So that's kind of the funny thing mm. here. You mm -hmm. can show all the guns you want, but the hint of a nipple, oh my God. <laughs> it, it's that it's that a you know now that, that that great discussion now you know the things that are frowned upon yeah. in media and society you know you know uh guns you know uh these these weapons meant for for murder even like you know the candy cigarettes things like that that yeah. are given to kids and but anything you know uh s s remotely sexual in nature it's automatically which is wild because this is not uh, sexual at all <laughs> right it's it's not sexual <laughs> i'm right you say remotely sexual and, and people say a woman's body is sexual by definition uh when they say you can't show a nipple it's just you know the nipple is not sexual for heaven's sake we all survived our first year two years uh, 
being fed by, by them. There was nothing sexual about that. So I, I think it's preposterous that you can't show nipples, but you can show, you know, a, a person getting harpooned. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, and then here we got some interior shots of uh, issue number two. Uh, yep. Uh, Joanna's escaping from one place after another. Boom, boom, boom. Break, breakneck pace, folks. Uh, and I think we got we one more set of slides here. Uh, oh, yeah. She's escaping on the streets of Milan, uh, wow. a place I have never been. I, I have traveled to some of the places that, that we feature, but sometimes it's just Google research to try to figure out what they look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I the closest I've been to Milan is probably Rome, and that was years ago. But uh, it would be fun to, uh, if, if, if I got to... Uh, get on a plane and visit all the places that Joanna goes. That would be pretty cool. Uh, in issue three, she winds up going to Monaco. All the places she goes in wow. in um, in the second series, in Blood for Blood, except for South Dakota, all the places she goes start with M. Uh, there's no reason for that. I just thought it would be fun. Montana, Milan, Malaysia, and Monaco. And oh, really? uh, I don't know what letter we'll pick for, <laughs> for book three. I don't know. Montreal. Montreal, there you go. That's it. <laughs> Montreal for my fellow Canadian uh, readers and, and viewers. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Are you in Canada? Canada? Yes, I'm up in uh, Toronto. Oh, excellent, excellent. I So we filmed um, Haven, the, the Stephen King TV series, in Nova Scotia because it's a perfect fit for Maine. It, you can you can double for Maine in Nova Scotia. And I, so I spent time there, and I loved it. I love Nova Scotia. Canada's great. I love Canada's it. Great. Born and raised, born and raised. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we mentioned uh, Gun Honey... Uh, multiple locations and uh, you guys did a great job uh, on just kind of the seamless transition that that balancing act of there's there's no I guess confusion there's no uh, it's just done kind of really well almost in a uh, um, like a like a like a film or a TV show you know uh, just Boom, 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 you know, cut. cut yes, yeah, so like on this one where he was like, How'd you, you know, how'd you, how'd you make it back? Like, well, you don't need, it's a long story. Like, yeah, we yeah, didn't I, need I, to see her getting, <laughs> we get it. Yeah. Right. We, we She escapes from Italy um, near the Swiss border. And then that's the last we see until she shows up in America. Yeah. Sometimes the, uh, the, the time gets truncated in a way that's not entirely realistic. Like, you have to fly from one place to another. It'd be a 13 hour flight. And, she seems to kind of make it in five hours or something. And yeah, you know, we fudge it around. Yeah, the I think end. That's, that's the nature of this genre where it's like, it doesn't, that's something we can suspend relief on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. James Bond is always going from place to place and you never see him flying coach and eating the little peanuts and looking yeah. at his watch and, you know, getting stuck in traffic. Somehow he always manages. So Joanna's in that same category of people who somehow she's like, manage. How long do you have the plane for? He's like, I mean, it's however long I need. I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I've got it for whatever time I need it. Uh, you know, it's like Roger Rabbit. So he, there was this movie, which younger viewers may not remember, called Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which was the first really good uh, interaction between animated characters and live action film. A classic. Yeah. It was it, it was great. And, but there's this, so Roger Rabbit is in a handcuff. He's handcuffed to this human. And at one point, they're trying to saw through the handcuffs, and he just pulls his arm out of the handcuff uh, to help saw. And the human says, you mean you could have taken your hand out of the handcuff <laughs> anytime and roger says no only when it was funny and uh, it's, it's a little bit like that here you know you you mean you could fly in five hours to get here yeah well no only when it's good for the story right? yeah, yeah. i can keep my, my helicopter for as long as the story requires it that's the rule you've got choppers you got souped up rvs that's uh true. we've got motorcycles um all kinds i think this have? might be one of my favorite issues though because using oh. that same logic um, you know, all the times Joanna's been able to use, you know, her body as an asset, they're like a couple times in a row, they're like, put them away. <laughs> it's not gonna, it's not gonna work in this situation. Right. And I That's thought that right. was so funny because I was like, Yeah, you gotta think on your feet this time. <laughs> right. There was the uh, scene where she's uh, chained up and she's trying to seduce the bounty hunter and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he's not going for it. And she says, Just my luck, I get the only gay bounty hunter in Milan. <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of us. Not not the right equipment, I think, was his line. Not the right equipment, yeah. yeah. A great line, a great line. Um, Another great line from uh, the first one. You guys did the point, uh, Leo pointing at the TV thing and like, nice gun, honey. 
I was like, he <laughs> <Right>. said it. <laughs> I, I did. To be fair, I did see one review. I, I read the reviews. I love reading reviews, even if they're negative. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read anything. I love knowing people are talking about what I'm doing. And uh, there was one who said, I thought that was pushing it when, when the character said, nice gun, honey. <laughs> That's pushing it. <laughs> I, I get it. I know why he said that. That's okay. I, I just couldn't resist it. You know, I thought it was hilarious. Thank you. Thank you. You're the perfect reader for me. Yes. I, I, I do have a, I'm a, I'm a dad and I do have a weakness for dad jokes. So once in a while I'll, I'll give in. Can't, can't, can't take this stuff too seriously, folks. This, this is That's comics. Right. This is, this yeah. is action, you know, uh, mystery. Uh, it's adult. It's fun. You know, just kind of go in there and, and enjoy it. Enjoy yeah, that, that's right. thank you for saying that. It's th this is this is popcorn to some extent. This is not. Uh, I, I'm not selling. This is something that'll change your life. And and yeah, I mean, I I hope that the characters have some depth and that you have some emotional reaction to what's going on because that's just more fun. For but sure. it's, it's but it's entertainment. You know, th this is this is definitely in the entertainment side of the. Uh, uh, of, of the industry. So we'll, we'll, I, I love serious books too. You know, there are people who do graphic novels that are searing and important and deal with tough issues. Mm -hmm. This really isn't that this, this is just going to get your pulse pounding and your palms sweating and uh, hopefully, you know, leave you glad you bought it. That's the beauty of comics. we got all kinds of different flavors and genres and, and depending what kind of mood you're in that day, uh, you know, pick, yeah, you, you want to have some fun folks, pick up, Gun honey, guaranteed, guaranteed to be entertained. Uh, this is great stuff, Charles. Yes, an international action thriller mystery. You know <laughs> what? Else? What am I missing here? Uh, no, you got it all. It, it's it's uh, right. International thriller, all that good stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know it. And 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 female led. So if you're in the mood for a for a a, a tough, resourceful, confident, intelligent. Uh, capable woman who uh knows how to get her way into and out of trouble that's what you'll get in this book that's you know, it's not what everyone wants every day but that's what you get from this book so if that turns you on if that gets you excited this is the book to read absolutely turned on uh strong <laughs> smart i'm so glad to hear that i, I did a good job <laughs> uh, man al's gotta put up with uh, after every <laughs> issue drop uh, al <laughs> You know, she knows uh, fully, fully entertained by this. Uh, well, good. I, I, I appreciate your uh, your patience with, uh, <laughs> with 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 some of us goofball male readers who like it uh, maybe just a tiny bit too much. Oh, there is definitely like from that page that we talked about earlier. I think, <laughs> Sarge, I don't know if you remember, but on the show as like a joke, I did like a super zoomed in on it and i said can you guys tell what this is and oh. it was like just like you can't tell what it is you just see like skin color yeah. and then yeah. like some spittle <laughs> and I'm like, everybody was like i don't know is it like a raining is it a waterfall I'm like, oh, yeah 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 read gun honey to find out that's right that's what it is it's, it's, it's a waterfall that i i think that's about right yeah and here she's got her cat right and then, so there's a question like she lives in san francisco she's got a cat in san francisco how did this cat get to malaysia what happens when she leaves it's like she doesn't take the cat with her we don't ask those questions that's what's called kitchen <laughs> logic you, you know, know what yeah and i assumed as a as like a lady in this line of work i want to be comfortable so i just assumed she she she'll leave everything else behind but she's not going to leave behind her cat so in my head, no, she the cat travels with her <laughs> there you go okay that works she 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 never never leaves her uh uh, her cat. There you go. <laughs> her travel cat. Yeah. Her travel cat. I like the sound <laughs> of that. Uh, she may have a really good cat sitter taking care of one at home. That wouldn't yeah. shock. <laughs> <laughs> the cat sitter taking. <laughs> I like that, man. Hey, she's layered, man. You never know what you're gonna get with. Uh, with you never know exactly. Yeah. So uh, this this, this was me being me. unintentionally cruel to Ang Hor Kang. I said the characters in a library. It's a rich man's mansion in, in Montana, and there's a library. And I didn't think about it. I just thought, you know, library, that's a place to do things. Yep. He had to draw every one of those books mm -hmm. on every <laughs> shelf in the library. And I feel terrible about it. You know, why didn't I say she was in, you know, an art gallery with one painting on the wall? That would have been easy to draw. Poor, poor Angkor King had to draw all those books. But I mean, he made it beautiful, of course. But just think Nailed about it. the amount of time he had to put into drawing all those books. I felt oh, yeah. very, very guilty. Uh, guilty, but you know what? Uh, we're happy for it because uh, <laughs> absolutely nails. This is probably my 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 favorite sequence. Uh, oh, yeah, from issue number one of Blood for Blood. Uh, yeah, just uh, great stuff here. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, another 
uh, another panel page here from from issue number one. That's uh, we got our, our mystery, our mystery new character, um, and I don't think it's spoiler to say at this point issue one's been out for a while. Uh, Joanna is set up. Yes, she is set up for murder. She finds herself on the run, uh, and then she's back with her old. Uh, what would you call him? Her her buddy. Oh. Yeah, um, she, he, he's not her partner exactly. Well, he was her minder. He, he mm -hmm. was the government agent that was assigned to uh, keep an eye on her while she mm -hmm. was performing her duty in mm -hmm. the first series. And they got along. They, they bickered and fought, but they, they eventually gained respect for each other. So he's come to her to say that she's been framed, and he thinks she's been framed by someone who used to work for him. And that's why he feels it's his responsibility to fix it. Um, Gun Honey, Blood for Blood. The uh, art on the left is Adam Hughes, of course. On the right is uh, a wonderful painter who's 96 years old. His name is Robert McGinnis, and he painted a lot of very famous movie posters, including the original James Bond movie posters with Sean Connery and uh, Audrey Hepburn with the cigarette holder and the cat on her shoulder for Breakfast at Tiffany's. Really? And uh, this he painted for us in 2021 when he was a spry uh, and youthful 95. Uh, and it's just amazing to me that wow. at uh, that age, he's producing gorgeous art. Uh, I, I hope he keeps at it for a good long time. He's a wonderful, kind man, and uh, I've worked with him, oh, probably 14, 15 years now, and uh, it's it's another privilege. You know, getting to work on hard case crime is, is a privilege in so many ways, but the single biggest, I think, is getting to work with incredibly talented people who otherwise I would just be a fan of, you know? You yeah. see their work, you see their books, their posters, their movie art, and so on, and you just love it but the chance to work with them, you know, to create something and have them illustrated is just, uh, it, it is like, you know, waking up in a dream, you know, you're a kid and you think one day, maybe I'll write a book that Robert McGinnis will paint the cover for. And then it happens. That's, that's too good to be true. You know, really? even if we never really? sold a copy, you know, if, if, if we never made a penny on the whole thing, just getting to work with Robert McGinnis and having him paint my character, that's, that's his his covers have been my favorite and oh, yeah? you know i get my i buy my comics you know from sergio he does retail too and uh -huh. when I, i'm i harassed him i harassed him about these books because <laughs> the covers have been so good across both uh volumes yeah. and um but the mcginnis ones have been my favorite for oh, sure thanks. They're, they're secretly i mean it's hard to pick you know how do you mm -hmm. how do you say no to adam hughes that art germ did one for this uh for issue one of the second series that's just just amazing it's gorgeous yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but i have a soft spot in my heart for robert mcginnis and frankly i'll tell you something else uh pretty much all our artists also have a soft spot in their heart for robert mcginnis you know they're all inspired by him he's been around so long that he's inspired two generations three generations of artists and Oh, uh, I think they, they all, if, if, if we had to pull all our artists, you know, who, who's the, like the biggest name and the biggest inspiration, I think McGinnis would be uh, up there on, even though he's not a household name among comic book readers. Um, mm -hmm. he, he inspired a lot of comic book mm -hmm. artists. Yeah. I wasn't aware he, he did. So he did the iconic, uh, breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, yes, that's right. Which you see in every dorm room in America, you know, with, with the, the pink sheath dress and, and Audrey Hepburn, you know, not quite in the act of smoking, but about to, yeah, um, yeah he painted that. And oh, also really? Barbarella and the odd couple and, uh, bunch of westerns clint eastwood and uh i don't even remember what all else a whole bunch of really good movies if you just google uh robert mcginnis you'll see a ton of his stuff and you'll recognize it immediately you'll just say oh my god he painted that uh, so to have him working on gun honey too is uh is, is pretty cool that's pretty cool i gotta check out some of that so i just thought he was another you know dope artist you know uh uh but yeah man okay. yeah, no, he's, he's got a legacy he's, he's uh he, he's he's done amazing things and um you know, his, his thing is his women always have incredibly long legs. Uh, he makes it work, you know, but their, their legs, if you actually sort of measure them and try to figure out how tall would this person be in real life, they'd all be like nine feet tall and their legs would be eight <laughs> and a half feet of that. And yeah. he just loves long legged ladies. Uh, not complaining. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Um, who, who would, you know, yeah. he, he's from the same, not quite the same generation as Vargas, but you remember the Vargas girls who would turn up in uh, uh, Playboy and I, I think probably also Saturday Evening Post, wherever Vargas uh, would uh, would draw. Uh, the McGinnis girl and the Vargas girl, these are like classic 20th century uh, mm -hmm. pinup art styles. And oh. uh, the Gibson girl was another one. 
Uh, you know, he was a contemporary of Norman Rockwell, and uh, he's in the uh, Society of Illustrators Hall of Fame side by side with Norman Rockwell. It's pretty, pretty impressive what he's done. Man, that's a good. Oh, you got to next time you got to clue me in on this stuff, man. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I knew him from like old, my dad collected like old pulp books and stuff. Yes. So I've seen him, his work on like old, old books that I probably just saw the cover and was like, mm, I knew my dad was a little bit of a creep, but I didn't really read the back yet. But I eventually got into, you know, that genre when I got a little bit older. You know, that's that's kind of how I started too. My dad was, uh, my dad collected the Mike Shane private eye novels and McGinnis did the covers for a lot of those. And mm -hmm. that's it. You know, you're a kid, you see these books on dad's shelf, you pull them down and you think, oh, well, that's, that, that, that's kind of nice. Yeah, or, or, King, or think... I was 10 and uh, I think Drawing of the Three, the cover, um, and I was like, I want to read this. And I hadn't read anything by him before or anything. And that was, I know it's like not the first book in the series either. No, and no, not even right. not even what he was probably more popular for um, okay. at the time. And I just like felt was obsessed. And then that's like I worked my way backwards that's in the catalog. Cool. And even now, like even if I don't have time to read it, like I make sure to like buy them all. And my daughter, she's just like, well, which one can I read? Because she's she just turned 11. Okay. And I was like okay. any of them because I I read it when I was ten and I right. probably so you're, you're 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 already older than I was. Yeah, I'm like you're you're a little late in the game. Like catch up, come on. I started. My grandmother was a big Stephen King fan, and so all the books were there on the shelf. I started with it uh, okay. when it came out, so I'm I'm older than you are, but it, you know, 1986, I think 87, mm -hmm. and. Um, what an amazing book to start with. It is just this brilliant book and it's huge. And I read it. It took me a month to read it. And uh, I fell in love with Stephen King's writing from that. And then I stole books from my grandmother's shelf and, uh, and became, you know, sort of a lifelong fan of Stephen King, but there are definitely King books that um, I think they're, they're, they're King books that are easier sort of entry points and, and harder mm -hmm. entry points in some ways, like a book like Joyland, which was the second book he wrote for hard case crime, a traditional novel, not a, graphic novel mm -hmm. um, i think that's an that's a pretty easy way in you know the characters are are young and it's uh kind of a sweetly nostalgic story there is a crime in it there there's murder in it uh but nothing too horrific it's not really a horror novel and okay. um yeah joyland might be an interesting way in for for uh for your daughter or the girl who loved tom gordon oh, yeah, yeah. Forget, forget your daughter I, i'm gonna i'm gonna check it i'll check it out I'll yeah check out joyland. Okay. Yeah, check, <laughs> Joyland, Joyland is an amazing book. Joyland, you know, okay. when people make lists of their favorite Stephen King books, of course, yeah. The Shining is on there and It and and yeah. uh, The Stand. But Joyland is on there an awful lot of the time. It's uh, it's nice to see how much people like that one. I gotta check that. I gotta, and in, in all honesty, I gotta. I'm gonna check out uh, a Hard Case Crime now. Well, thank uh, you. I, 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 I like been reading her, uh, your guys' stuff. She's a big fan. Um, and I even know, Haven, know, I'm that annoying person you watch TV with. Like, I know where that's from. <laughs> Do you <laughs> know where that's from? <laughs> you know, Haven was so different from the book. You know, if, yeah. if you watch Haven, you'll see that we invented all sorts of characters that weren't there in the book, just because yeah. the book's very short. And we had to we had to fill out the universe with more characters and so on. So many uh, Easter eggs to so many Easter eggs, and that's, that's right. what that's where like my husband he's like I, he doesn't like some shows. He like what was the more recent one? What was it called uh, on Hulu? Oh, uh, you're thinking of um, the uh, Castle Rock? Yeah, That's Castle Rock. And my husband, he's like, I'm not. He watched the first episode and then he watched it on his own because I, I am that person. I'm like, I could tell you exactly <laughs> <laughs> where each Easter egg is from. I, I like that sort of thing. I, I'm a sucker for a good Easter egg. Oh, man, she's, she's the same way with the with the comics. Uh huh. Always <laughs> putting out all the Easter. It's yeah, not... I'm trying to think. We, we're going to have to pack more Easter eggs in, of course when you have a long history, it's easier to do Easter eggs because there's more for you to refer back to. Uh, when you're creating a brand new character, an Easter egg, you know, how would anyone know it's an Easter egg? It's brand new. But um, sure. there there are a couple of uh, odd little Easter eggs in, in uh, Gun Honey. I mean, really obscure things. There's a uh, scene in issue three, which you guys haven't seen yet, where there's a character who is um, doesn't want to get arrested and he hands over the business card of his uh, attorney to the people who are about to take him in. And the name of the attorney is Martin H. Ehrengraf, which is a name that won't mean anything to anybody unless they happen to have read a series of really great short stories by Lawrence Block, one of our authors, about a, a criminal attorney who's literally a criminal attorney. He commits crimes to get his his clients off, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> declared innocent. And um, just, so how many people are going to recognize the name Martin Ehrengraf? None. Zero. 
one or two. Well, anyone who anyone who watches House of Nerd now, everyone will know it. So oh, yes, yeah. if you if you have not read the Martin Aaron Graff stories by Lawrence Block, they were collected in a volume called Aaron Graff for the Defense, and they are breathtaking. Each story takes place entirely in Martin Aaron Graff's office. You never actually see him commit any crimes. The crimes are always off stage, and they are chilling. He's like a like a miniature Hannibal Lecter. He'll do anything. He'll kill people. He'll do absolutely anything to get his clients out. Uh, uh, off from going to jail. 100%. I'm checking that out. Uh, that might be the next book I, I check out at the library. Uh, cool. Hard Case Crime, a line of pulp style paperback crime novels. Yep. And uh, there you have it, folks. And uh, again, one, one more time, uh, one more reminder for everybody Gun Honey Blood for Blood number two dropping Wednesday, September 28th. For Don't me. miss it. Hope hope you hope you get it. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, I, I'm going to go to my local comic book store in Manhattan and and try to grab a couple before it uh, before it's all sold out. We should be Absolutely. selling. Yeah, uh, this, uh, Gun Honey, folks. If if you've been paying attention, flying off the shelves. So get to your shops fast. Get there early, uh, and then you know po post them online. Let's see, you know which. Which which lovely covers and then yes yeah let us know what you want you know tell tell us which artists you want more of and you know any any feedback you've got I'm I'm grateful for really a positive negative in between I love hearing from readers love hearing what people like and don't like that that'd be great awesome I'm, I'll be tweeting at you uh, daily now uh -huh. excellent <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, where can uh, where can everybody find you Charles well hard case crime is at the um, Obvious URL, hardcasecrime.com. No dashes or hyphens or other punctuation, just uh, hardcasecrime.com. And uh, you can also find us. There are two fan pages on Facebook that we pop in on periodically. So if you just search for Hard Case Crime there, you'll find. Uh, similarly, on Instagram there, there are some hyphens. But if you just search for Hard Case Crime, it'll find the account. Uh, and Twitter, I think, is at Hard Case Crime. So anywhere on social media. We're not on TikTok yet. Maybe we should be. I could do a little dance. But mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, all the old old time uh, old school social media, you can find us uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Where else are we? Well, at our website and in every bookstore. You know, if if you don't have a bookstore near you, go to Amazon. Uh, I know there are people out there who don't love Amazon. Uh, so if you have a local bookseller, by all means, patronize them. That would be great. Uh, but if you don't, uh, Amazon has all our stuff. So go ahead and order from there. Uh, we have electronic digital versions too. So if you like Comicsology, you can you know, read uh, Gun Honey that way. And uh, we have 25 or 26 other comics too. So if you like Gun Honey, if you enjoy the genre, if you think, you know, another crime story might be fun, do a quick search online and you'll find uh, two dozen other hard case crime comics, all sorts of different things, cool stuff. And uh, check it out. You know, Krista Faust did one called uh, Peep Land with Gary Phillips. Megan Abbott and Allison Galen did one called Normandy Gold. These are great comics. So, uh, you know, when you, when you run out of Gun Honey to read, there's more good stuff for you. I'm going to be checking out Peep Land as well. Yeah, I, I loved uh, Krista's uh, Hit Me was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So so Krista, when she was a, a young woman in New York, uh, she worked in a peep show herself. Uh, and she presumably didn't have all the adventures her, the character in Peep Land has because that involves murder and so on. But um, <laughs> if you want to talk about authenticity, you know, she, she yeah. worked hard with the artists uh, for... Um, uh, for P plan to make sure that 1980s Times Square in New York City looked right. You know, mm -hmm. the, the 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 traffic lights were right, and the the interior of the Peep Show booths looked like they really did. Uh, so that that moment of squalor before everything was taken over by Disney is captured by by uh, Krista here, uh, and she's a terrific writer. And Gary Gary Phillips, who wrote with her, is also a terrific writer. Um, so yeah, Peep Peep Land is is a great place to start. That was our very first hard case crime comic, so you could do a lot worse than starting there. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's it. That's at the top of the read pile. Uh, Charles, thank you so much. Thank for you both you know. with us today. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks. Um, El, did you have any final any final thoughts or words? Nope, I think, <laughs> I think I, we ran the, through it all. We ran the gamut. Well, you know, when when uh, when issues three and four come out, if there are any shocking surprises there that you absolutely need to tell me about, feel free to get in touch. Uh, and then hopefully sometime in uh, 2023, Gun Honey will return. Looking forward to it very, very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles. And, uh, you know, you're welcome back in the house anytime. I, I, it is an honor. I'm delighted to come back anytime. Have a good night, guys.
All right, folks, that's it, folks. So we're wrapping it up. Uh, be sure to check out Gun Honey Blood for Blood 2, dropping September 28th. Have a great night. Good night.